If you're looking for something new to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark, which I started with the creator of Top 5 Unknowns. Every week we have a new mystery for you to solve. If you like escape rooms, puzzles, or riddles, then you'll hopefully like Chapter Dark. In our latest video, an attorney has been murdered after getting a big promotion. His killer is later found dead, apparently by his own hand. Was the attorney's murder a random act of violence or a professional hit? This is just one of the mysteries available for you to solve on Chapter Dark. Do you have the detective skills to solve them all? You can find a link to Chapter Dark in the description box below. Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our sponsors, Raid Shadow Legends. You've probably already heard of Raid Shadow Legends, and there's a good reason for that. It's an awesome role-playing game that is fun and easy to get into, but the gameplay is also deep and complex. One reason I love Raid is the sheer amount of heroes you can play with. They have over 500 heroes, and there are so many ways to customize them, so no two heroes are alike. There are a lot of different game modes in Raid. Personally, I like using my team of heroes to take on other players in the arena. Over the past few weeks, the development team has added a bunch of great new updates. The first is Champion Fragments. With this update, you collect pieces of champions and then use the pieces to summon amazing champions. There are special events running all the time where you can collect Champion Fragments. Another great new feature is the Bazaar, which is where you collect high value items with the gold bars that you win in the Tag Team Arena. Finally, they've extended the daily login rewards to 270 days and you get a free champion for just logging in. With so many updates, there's never been a better time to start playing. Just go to the description box below this video, click on the special links, and if you are a new player, you'll get 50,000 silver, 50 gems, an energy refill, a clan boss key, 5 mystery shards, a 1 day experience booster, and 1 free epic champion, Shaman. All these treasures will be waiting for you here. Good luck and I'll see you there. Number 3 Steve Haugen and Jeanette Bowman Steve Haugen and Jeanette Bowman met in St. Regis, Montana. They were both teachers. Eventually, they moved away from St. Regis, and for a while, their relationship was long distance. Bowman lived in Waco, Washington, while Haugen lived in Oak Ridge, Oregon. In Oak Ridge, Haugen worked as a high school counselor, and he coached track. Bowman taught computers and business at a high school, but in the fall of 2005, she was going to start teaching at a college in Oak Ridge. In June 2005, Bowman moved to Oak Ridge. On June 29th, after Bowman settled into her new home, the couple left for a camping trip. They drove to the Willamette National Forest, which is only about 20 miles from Oak Ridge. With them was Caesar, Steve Haugen's beloved dog. On July 1st, several days after they left for the trip, some people happened upon their campsite. They found the dead bodies of 54-year-old Steve Haugen, 56-year-old Jeanette Bowman, and Caesar. They had all been shot to death. The police did not specify how many times they were shot. Police did say that two guns were used in the murders. One was a high-powered gun, and the other was a low-powered gun. The police believe that the killer shot them from a distance with one gun and then moved in and used the other gun to shoot them from about five to seven feet away. Another possibility is that it was not a lone killer and two or more people could have worked together. Some items were taken from the campsite. This included a 44 Magnum Smith & Wesson revolver, a brown leather shoulder holster, and custom fishing rods. The license plates from Haugen's car were also stolen. His license plate number was Oregon CL47763. None of the items that were stolen have ever been recovered. The police do not think that the motive behind the murders was robbery, nor was a robbery gone wrong. Instead, they think that the items were taken as trophies. 
the person or persons who attacked them simply wanted to kill them. The police also don't think that the killer or killers were known to the victims. That was because Haugen and Bowman were both well liked and they had no enemies. One theory is that the killer was something that the FBI calls a super hunter. A super hunter moves into a national forest and they believe that it belongs to them. Since they believe the forest belongs to them, they can become violently territorial. They may also take items as souvenirs from their crime scenes. One suspect that the police had was serial killer Israel Keyes. Keyes lived in Alaska, but he would often travel thousands of miles to commit his murders. Often, he just happened upon his victims to kill them at random. It's suspected that he killed at least 11 people. Keyes died by suicide in December 2012 after he was arrested for the murder of an 18-year-old woman in Anchorage, Alaska. However, the police were able to eliminate Israel Keyes as a suspect in the murders of Haugen and Bowman. The lead investigator on the case said that he has two or three suspects, but he does not have enough evidence to charge them with anything. So at the time of this video, the murders of Steve Haugen, Jeanette Bowman, and Caesar are considered cold. Number 2. The Blind River Murders 62-year-old Gord McAllister and his 59-year-old wife, Jackie, lived in Lindsay, Ontario, Canada. The couple had been married for nearly 39 years. On June 27, 1991, they set off in their newly purchased RV. They were planning on taking a month-long vacation. They were driving on the Trans-Canada Highway, which is a 4,860-mile highway that stretches from coast to coast. On the afternoon of June 27th, they stopped in Blind River, Ontario. Blind River is a picturesque small town that is about 90 miles from the Canadian-American border. The couple parked at the rest stop and they walked around. They thought it was a charming town and they decided to camp there for the night. At about 1 a.m., Gordon and Jackie were awoken by someone pounding on the door of their RV. It was a man who said he was a police officer. He told them they needed to move their RV. Gord got out of bed and he opened the door. When he did, a man with stringy blonde hair, armed with a 20 gauge shotgun and a 22 caliber rifle, forced his way in. He told the McAllisters that he was going to rob them and then kill them. The McAllisters didn't think that the man was serious about killing them, so they handed over any valuables they had. Then, completely unprovoked, the man with stringy blonde hair shot Jackie in the chest. Gord ran for the door and the man fired two shots at him. Gord managed to get out of the RV and he rolled under it. Seconds after he did, a car pulled in to the rest stop. The driver of the car was 29-year-old Brian Major. Major was married and he had a 4-year-old son. He lived in the town of Elliott Lake, which is about 35 miles from Blind River. When Major stepped out of his car, he had no idea what was going on at the rest stop. Then he saw the armed man with the stringy blonde hair emerge from the McAllister's RV. When Major saw the man, he got back into his car. Major tried to start his car, but before he could, the man shot him through the windshield. Then the gunman ran away. Gordon McAllister then rolled out from under his RV and he ran to the road. As Gord made his way to the road, he realized he had been shot in the back and in one of his feet. He managed to flag down a truck driver who called the police. 
Sadly, it was too late to do anything for 59-year-old Jackie McAllister and 29-year-old Brian Major. They were pronounced dead at the scene. Lord McAllister survived his gunshot wounds. The local newspaper did a story about the double homicide. A person who read the story got in contact with the police. He said he was driving by the rest stop around the time of the shooting. Suddenly, someone driving a blue van shot out of the rest stop and started driving in the wrong lane. The man thought he was going to collide head on with the van, but then the driver got into the proper lane. The police thought that the blue van was their best lead, so they checked with the owners of 3,500 vans in Canada and the United States. But it did not lead to an arrest. A few weeks after the murders, Gordon McAllister described the killer to an expert who used state-of-the-art computer software to create this image. But once again, it did not lead to an arrest. For four years, the case sat cold. Then in 1995, the police found a possible suspect. His name is Ronald Glenn West. West was born in 1947. He grew up on a farm in a rural community north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He moved to Blind River in 1988, about three years before the murders. In 1995, there was a string of violent daylight armed robberies in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Sault Ste. Marie is less than 90 miles from Blind River. The police were sure that the robberies were connected. All the victims were working alone or they were home alone and they were either female or elderly. The police first became aware of Ronald West after he pawned some diamonds and rings from the robberies at a pawn shop. He used his real name and driver's license to pawn the items. The police searched West's home and they found nothing of interest, but they arrested him nevertheless. When West was arrested, his two sons were put into foster care and his common-law wife moved out of their home. The couple who moved into their home found some unusual items hidden in the bathroom. They found some jewelry that was stolen in the robberies, a photo of a nude woman, and the registration form for a 22 caliber handgun. In October 1995, Ronald Glenn pleaded guilty to several charges connected to the robberies and he was sentenced to eight years in prison. The police questioned him about the Blind River murders, but he denied having anything to do with them. West's lawyer pointed out that while West committed violent robberies, he did not kill anyone. So he was not charged with the murders. Four years after Ronald West was arrested in August 1999, he was connected to two other brutal crimes. The first crime happened on May 6, 1970, about 29 years earlier. 34-year-old Doreen Morby lived in Gromley, Ontario. Gromley is a rural community north of Toronto. Doreen was a nurse and she lived with her husband, Albert, and her two-year-old son, Brent. Albert was a teacher and he left that morning to go to work. When he came home that afternoon, he found Doreen's dead body on the floor in their home. She had been sexually assaulted. She was shot three times in the back and five times in the head. Their son Brent was unharmed. The police thought that the murder weapon was a 22 caliber gun that held nine bullets. At the time, a handgun that held nine bullets was rare in Canada. Just 13 days later, the area was rocked by yet another brutal murder. Helen Ferguson was 37 years old and she lived with her family in Palgrave, Ontario, which is about 25 miles from Gromley. 
Like Doreen, Helen was a nurse and she was married to a school teacher. On May 19, 1970, Helen was home with her seven-year-old son Dale, who had the mumps. Dale said that he was in his room and he heard someone knocking on the door. Minutes later, his mother came to his room and told him that there was a man there who had a sick child. She said that she was going to help them. A short time later, Dale heard a crash and three loud bangs. He ventured out of his room and he found his mother bleeding to death. She had been shot once in the head and twice in the spine. She did not survive her wounds. She had also been sexually assaulted. The police immediately saw connections between the murders. Both victims were mothers who were home with their children. They were both nurses who were married to teachers. Both had been sexually assaulted and shot multiple times with a 22 caliber handgun. The media dubbed the murderer the 22 caliber killer. People in the area were in a panic and they were terrified that the killer would strike again. But he didn't. The police also didn't make an arrest of the cases. The police had a theory about the murders. There were no signs of forced entry or a break-in. Alan Ferguson's son, Dale, remembered that the killer knocked on the door. The police suspected that the man may have identified himself as a police officer and this is why the victims let him into their homes. Nearly three decades later, a detective with the Ontario Provincial Police was reviewing Ronald West's case. What caught his attention was the registration form for the 22 caliber handgun that was found hidden in his home. The gun was registered in 1969 and it was sold in 1972. What he noted was that the 22 caliber handgun held nine bullets. So the detective looked at where Wes was living in 1970. He learned that Wes lived in Toronto in 1970 where he worked as a police officer. He used to vacation in the area where Doreen Morby was killed. To get to the vacation area from his home in Toronto, he would have driven by the home of Helen Ferguson. The detective then talked to Wes's former common-law wife. She broke up with Wes after he was arrested for the robberies. While he was in jail, he wrote her a letter. She handed over the letter to the police. A forensic expert managed to get Wes's DNA from the stamp. It turned out that the 22 caliber killer's DNA had been saved after all those years. The killer's DNA was compared to Wes's DNA, and it was a match. Wes was charged with the murders of Doreen Morby and Helen Ferguson in August 1999. In August 2001, Wes pleaded guilty to the two murders and he was given a life sentence. Ronald West remains a suspect in the Blind River murders, but he has never been charged. Some circumstantial evidence connects him to the murders. For example, he lived only about 12 miles from the crime scene. He also looks remarkably like the composite image, except for the hair. But investigators believe Wes could have been wearing a wig during the murders. At the time of the murders, Wes owned a 22 caliber rifle and a 20 gauge shotgun, which were the guns used in the killings. Finally, in the summer of 1991, he owned a blue van. However, none of the evidence is definitive enough to charge him with the murders of Jackie McAllister and Brian Major. At the time of this video, Wes is still incarcerated. In 2012, Gordon McAllister passed away without his wife's murder officially being solved. Number 1. Julianne Williams and Lauren Winans 
Julianne Williams and Laura Winans met in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1995. They were both training to be outdoor trip leaders with a women's nonprofit group. After meeting, unbeknownst to their families, they started a romantic relationship. In May 1996, the couple decided to go camping. Wynans and Williams had a love of the outdoors and they were both veteran backpackers. On May 24, 1996, they traveled to Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. On June 1, 1996, Julianne Williams was supposed to start a new job at Lake Champlain, Vermont. Williams was due back to her apartment on May 28th so she could pack and move out by the end of the month. When she didn't return to the apartment by May 30th, her roommate called her parents. Williams' parents listened to her answering machine and there were several messages about her missing appointments. Williams' parents reported her missing on May 31st. Later that same day, their car was found. Then their dog, Taj, was found wandering around the park. The next day, just off the Appalachian Trail, hikers found the dead bodies of 24-year-old Julianne Williams and 26-year-old Laura Winans. Winans' body was found inside their tent, and Williams' body was found down in the bankment, about 30 to 40 feet from the tent. Both had been bound with duct tape, and duct tape had been placed over their mouths. They were both nude, but it did not appear that they had been sexually assaulted. They bled to death after their throats were slit. Their campsite was beside a mountain stream. The police suspected that the stream drowned out the sound of someone approaching their campsite. Since the couple was killed in a national park, the FBI was called in to investigate. There was immediate speculation that the murders were a hate crime. While there was speculation behind the motive, the FBI had a problem tracking down a suspect. Over a year went by without much progress being made in the case. But on July 7, 1997, a woman was riding a bike in Shenandoah National Park. A man driving a pickup truck tried to run her off the road. He also kept yelling sexual profanities at her. He parked his truck and tried to get the woman into it, but she managed to fight him off. He then tried to run her over four or five times. When he was unsuccessful, he drove away. The woman reported the attempted kidnapping to a park ranger. Shortly afterward, 29-year-old Daryl David Rice was arrested as he was trying to leave the park. At the time, Rice was living in Columbia, Maryland. A week earlier, he had been fired from his job. He wrote computer training discs for a telecommunications company. He had been fired because of his erratic behavior. This included making derogatory comments towards women. He also purposely bumped into a woman who was carrying a coffee, causing her to spill. Rice would also steal people's lunches and hide them. One time, he punched a hole in the wall of the men's washroom. In 1998, Rice pleaded guilty to attempting to kidnap the cyclist. He was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison. When Rice was arrested, the FBI immediately suspected he may have killed Julianne Williams and Laura Winans. The first reason they suspected him was because of the location where he tried to kidnap the cyclist. Rice attacked the cyclist in the same national park. Lions and Winan were found just off one of the roads that runs through the park. Rice attempted to kidnap the cyclist on the same road. The FBI also knew that Rice was in the park around the same time that Williams and Winans were killed. Williams and Winans were last seen alive on May 24th. 
there were surveillance cameras at the entrances of the park. Rice was recorded on video in the park on May 25th, 26th, and June 1st. Even though there was video evidence that he was in the park on those days, he denied being there on May 25th and 26th. He did admit that he was in the park on June 1st. The FBI also thought that Rice was a good suspect because they thought he hated women and gay people. They pointed to his erratic behavior at his former place of employment as evidence of this. Rice's lawyer argued that Rice didn't hate women and gay people. Rice's lawyer pointed out that Rice harassed and said insulting things to straight men he worked with as well. Also, there was no evidence that he had anything against gay people. After Rice was arrested for attempting to kidnap the cyclist, he was interviewed by FBI agents and U.S. Marshals. During those interviews, he talked negatively about women and admitted, at times, he had yelled derogatory things at them. He specifically mentioned one incident that happened on Route 29. This got one investigator thinking. The Virginia State Police were trying to identify a killer known as the Route 29 Stalker. In March 1996, 25-year-old Alicia Showalter Reynolds lived in Baltimore, Maryland. She was getting a PhD in pharmacology at John Hopkins University. At around 7.30 a.m. on March 2, 1996, Reynolds left to meet her mother to do some shopping in Charlottesville, Virginia. It was about a 150 mile trip that involved driving on Route 29. When Reynolds didn't arrive at the shopping mall, she was reported missing. At around 6 p.m. that afternoon, her car, a white Mercury Tracer, was found on the side of Route 29 near Culpeper, Virginia, which is about 45 miles from Charlottesville. Under one of the windshield wipers was a white napkin. Usually, this is a sign that the car had mechanical problems. The police checked the car and there was nothing wrong with it. There was no trace of Reynolds or any clue as to what happened to her. The next day, the police set up a roadblock close to where Reynolds' car was abandoned and they questioned the drivers that they stopped. Three people said that they saw Reynolds standing outside of her car on the side of the road. A clean-shaven white man in his 30s with dark hair, who was about 5'10 to 6 feet tall, was with her. He was driving a dark pickup truck, possibly a green Nissan. After that information was made public, nearly 20 women got in contact with the police. They said that they were driving along Route 29 and a man driving a dark pickup truck drove up behind them. He would hog his horn and flash his lights to get their attention. He would pull up beside them and start yelling that there was something wrong with their vehicle and they should pull over. Most of the women didn't pull over and the man would get angry. Sometimes he would yell derogatory things at them. When the women did pull over, he explained that he noticed that they were having car problems. For example, he said that sparks were flying out from under their car. He then offered them a ride to the nearest phone. Three women got into his vehicle. Two of them said that they did not have any problems with the man and he was courteous. But one woman, Carmelia Shomo, who was stopped a week before Alicia Showalter Reynolds went missing, said she had problems with the man. It was night when Shomo got into his truck, and as he drove, he kept slowing down. He claimed he kept slowing down because he was having problems seeing because of the headlights from the vehicles behind him. He also pulled over three times. Shomo got a bad feeling about the man, so she started fighting with him. The man ended up pushing her out of his vehicle, and she broke her ankle. 
On May 7, 1996, two months after Alicia Showalter Reynolds went missing, her body was found in a wooded area about 15 miles from where her car was abandoned. The police did not release the cause of death other than saying it was a homicide. Reynolds went missing about three months before Laura Winans and Julianne Williams were murdered. Daryl Rice was questioned about Alicia Showalter Reynolds' murder, and he denied having anything to do with it. But the police found circumstantial evidence that suggested that Rice was the Route 29 stalker. When 13 of the women encountered the stalker, Rice was absent from work and he had no alibis for those times. Rice's father's home was in Culpeper, Virginia, which is close to where Reynolds was last seen alive. Eight women, including the woman who broke her ankle, Armelia Ashomo, identified Rice as the stalker. However, there was supposedly a problem with Shomo's identification. According to Rice's lawyer, she was shown the photograph of another man. Supposedly, when she was shown the photograph of the second man, she got teary-eyed and said, Yes, that's him. That's exactly him. The man she supposedly identified was suspected serial killer Richard Mark Ivanitz. On September 9, 1996, 16-year-old Sophia Silva was kidnapped from the front of her home in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. Her body was found just over a month later on October 14, 1996. It had been dumped in a creek about 20 miles from her home. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Nine months later, on May 1, 1997, 15-year-old Kristen Lisk and her 12-year-old sister, Katie Lisk, disappeared from their front yard in Spotsylvania after they got off the bus. The sisters lived less than 10 miles from Sofia Silva. Five days later, their bodies were found in a creek about 40 miles from their home. They both had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. It's believed that all three victims were held captive for a short time before they were killed. DNA was found on their bodies and it was compared to DNA found in Sofia Silva. The DNA was a match so the police knew that they were killed by the same man. But at the time, they did not know who that man was. Nearly five years later, on June 25th, 2002, a 15-year-old named Kara Robinson came into the police station in Columbia, South Carolina. Kara's ankles had shackles on them. Kara explained she had been kidnapped 18 hours earlier and she had been taken to her kidnapper's apartment. The man sexually assaulted her and then he fell asleep. While he slept, she managed to escape. She led the police to the apartment where she was being held. But by the time the police got there, the man had disappeared. The police identified the occupant of the apartment as 38-year-old Richard Vonitz. Two days later, they tracked Vonitz to a motel in Sarasota, Florida. When he discovered that the police had surrounded his room, he shot himself in the head. A judge examined the evidence against Daryl Rice in connection with the Route 29 stalker case. He said that the defense was misleading when they said that Carmelita Shomo identified Richard Ivanitz as her attacker. The judge said he did not think that Shomo picked Ivanitz as her attacker and she had always maintained that it was Daryl Rice who picked her up. In late 2004, Rice was charged with kidnapping Shomo. In August 2005, he made a plea deal with the district attorney. He took an Alfred plea, which allowed him to plead guilty, but still maintain his innocence. He was sentenced to 14 months in prison. That sentence ran concurrently with the 11-year sentence he was already serving for attempting to kidnap the cyclist. Rice is still considered the prime suspect in the murder of Alicia Showalter Reynolds. 
However, he has never been charged in connection with her murder, and her murder remains unresolved to this day. While Rice was in jail, the FBI tried to build a case against him for the murders of Julianne Williams and Laura Winans. Then on April 10th, 2002, nearly six years after Williams and Winans murders, U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft announced that Daryl Rice had been indicted on four counts of capital murder. He was charged with two counts of murder on the basis that the motive was a hate crime. The other two counts were standard murder charges in case the jury did not accept that the murders were hate crimes. Rice was looking at a death sentence if he was convicted of any of the charges. But then, the prosecution's case ran into significant problems after Rice was indicted. Hairs from a man were found on the duct tape that was used to bound Laura Winans wrists. DNA testing was done on the hairs. Rice's lawyer said that the DNA test showed that the hairs did not belong to Rice. The prosecution said that that statement was not accurate, but they did not elaborate on why it was not accurate. The DNA testing did result in the charges being dropped against Rice in February 2004. The defense contended that there were several significant problems with the case against Rice and that's why the prosecution did not proceed with the charges. The first was the DNA, which they said excluded Rice. They pointed out that the DNA testing did not exclude another possible suspect, Richard Markovonitz. The prosecution argued that one piece of evidence that connected Rice to the crime scene was that on May 28th, Rice called the Spectrum Center, which is a gay rights organization in California. The prosecution said that Rice got the phone number from Julianne Williams' journal. The defense said that wasn't possible and the phone call was just a coincidence. The defense noted that Williams' journal was found at the crime scene. The phone number was not written down anywhere in the journal. Also, the number was to a private line that was not given out to people outside of the organization. So how did Rice happen to call that number? The defense had a logical explanation. The area code and the first three digits were the same as the hotline to get concert tickets for the rock band, The Grateful Dead. Anyone who knew Rice knew he was a massive Grateful Dead fan. The last four digits of the phone number were the same as Rice's work number. Rice called his work an hour after he made the call to the Spectrum Center. His lawyer said that the call to the Spectrum Center was simply a mistake. The prosecution's theory regarding motive was that Rice killed Williams and Winans because he hated women and gay people. While there was arguably evidence that Rice hated women, there was not much evidence to support the theory that he had something against gay people. The only evidence that he was homophobic came from the people he was in prison with. One of Rice's fellow inmates claimed that Rice had admitted to him that he killed Williams and Winans because they were lesbians. Rice's lawyer said that the inmate was nothing but a jailhouse snitch who was looking to shave time off his own sentence. There was no evidence to prove that Rice said anything about killing the couple. Another inmate recorded a conversation between himself and Rice. When the prosecution presented the transcript of the recording as evidence, it said that Rice stated that he hated gay people. But the defense was able to prove that the audio had either been edited or mistranscribed. What Rice really said was that the investigators tried to get him to say that he hated gay people. The prosecution said that they did not do anything wrong. They said that the defense had the audio enhanced and this is how they heard the full context of the conversation. When the judge dismissed the murder charges against Rice, he didn't do it with prejudice. Had he dismissed the charges with prejudice, the prosecution would have never been able to refile the charges. 
Rice was released from prison in 2007 and then returned to prison twice for parole violations. In 2014, it was believed he was living in the Durango, Colorado area. His current whereabouts are unknown. Many investigators believe that Rice is responsible for the murders of Alicia Showalter Reynolds, Julianne Williams, and Laura Winans. However, not everyone is convinced. Some people believe that Richard Markovanis killed Williams, Winans, and Reynolds. After all, the DNA testing did not rule him out. But the investigators and prosecuting attorneys do not think he was the killer. They point out that Ivanis kidnapped teenage girls, held them captive for several hours or possibly days, and then strangled them to death. They think that there is little to no chance that he was responsible for the three murders. Other people think that the person who killed Laura Winans and Julianne Williams was a serial killer known as the Colonial Parkway Killer. The first Colonial Parkway murders happened over a decade before Winans and Williams were killed. On October 12, 1986, a jogger found a car that had gone down the embankment of the Colonial Parkway near Williamsburg, Virginia. Inside the car were two dead bodies. They were identified as 27-year-old Kathleen Thomas and 21-year-old Rebecca Dowski. The car was found on federal property, so the FBI was called in to investigate. One body was in the back seat, and the other one was in the hatchback. Thomas and Dowski had been bound with rope, but the rope was not found. There were also rope burns around their neck, which indicated they had been strangled. It was later determined that strangulation was the cause of death. After they were strangled, both of their throats were slit. Thomas's throat was cut nearly to the point of decapitation. The inside of the car had been doused with diesel fuel. It appeared that the killer tried to set the car ablaze but was unable to get the fire started. So they pushed the car down the embankment, most likely in the hopes that it would go into the river. But it became entangled in some brush before it made it to the river. Thomas and Dowski had started dating several months earlier in the spring of 1986. They were last seen alive three days earlier. Dowski was enrolled at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg and they were last seen on the campus. There were no signs of robbery and both women were fully clothed. There were no signs of sexual assault. It's thought that the two women went somewhere isolated to be alone. Thomas had her wallet out and the police thought that this was a clue as to what happened to them. They thought that someone posing as law enforcement interrupted them. He got them out of the car and he put pieces of rope around their necks. He strangled them to death and then cut their throats. He then put their bodies into the car and then drove to the area where the car was found. Because he couldn't start a fire, he pushed the car down the embankment. The police were not able to determine where the couple was killed. Nor could they determine the time of death but suspected that they were killed on October 9th, which is the night they went missing. One theory is that there was more than one killer, which would explain how the two women were overpowered. Thomas had graduated from the Naval Academy and served in the Navy for several years. She was athletic and she had martial arts training. Dowski was also athletic. There is also evidence that Thomas put up a fight. A tuft of hair was found in her hand. For several reasons, the police also thought that the killer or killers might have been fishermen. The first clue that they were fishermen was a rope fiber that was found in Thomas's hair. It appeared to be from a fishing line. 
Also, fishermen are known to carry sharp knives. Finally, at the time, many boats ran on diesel fuel. Diesel burns hotter than gasoline, but it's much harder to ignite with something like matches. It's thought that the killer or killers used the diesel simply because it was what they had on hand. While the FBI had a lot of theories, they did not find any promising suspects in the murders. Eleven months later, on September 23, 1987, 20-year-old David Nobling took his cousin and his cousin's date, 14-year-old Robin Edwards, out to an arcade. During that evening, Nobling and Robin secretly made plans to meet up later that night. Sometime after midnight, Robin snuck out of her home and Nobling picked her up. The next morning, Nobling's Black Ford Ranger was found abandoned on Ragged Island, which is a state wildlife refuge. Nobling's truck was found about 20 miles from the Colonial Parkway. Both doors were open and the radio was playing. The keys were also in the ignition. The police did not think that anything serious had happened, so they returned the vehicle to Nobling's family. Three days later, David Nobling and Robin Edwards' bodies were found on a beach about a mile from where Nobling's truck had been abandoned. Robin had been shot once in the head, execution style. Nobling had been shot twice, once in the shoulder and once in the head. It's suspected that Robin was shot first and Nobling tried to run away. He was shot in the shoulder and then the kill shot was delivered to his head. It's believed that Robin had been sexually assaulted. 18-year-old Cassandra Haley and 20-year-old Richard Call were students at Christopher Newport University in Newport News, Virginia. They were in the same business class together. In early April 1988, Paul asked Haley out on a date and she accepted. On April 10th, 1988, they went out on their first date. First, they went to a movie. Then they went to a party at an apartment across the street from the campus. Unfortunately, they never made it home. The next morning, Keith Call's car was found abandoned beside the Colonial Parkway. The driver's door was ajar. The car was found about two miles from where Kathleen Thomas and Rebecca Dowski were found a year and a half earlier. Inside the car were some of their clothes, Cassandra Haley's purse, and Call's watch. Paul and Haley were subsequently reported missing. They have never been found dead or alive. It is believed that the couple parked somewhere isolated so that they could be intimate. The killer or killers found them. They were murdered and their bodies were dumped in an unknown location. On September 5, 1989, 21-year-old Daniel Lauer and 18-year-old Anna Maria Phelps were driving from Amelia County, Virginia to Virginia Beach, Virginia. Phelps was dating Lauer's brother and they lived together in Virginia Beach. Lauer was moving in with them. But tragically, they never arrived in Virginia Beach. On the morning that they should have arrived in Virginia Beach, Lauer's car was found at a rest stop in New Kent County, Virginia, off Interstate 64. What was unusual was that the car was found in the westbound rest stop and they had been driving east. The car was parked on the truck side of the rest stop in a weird angle near a no parking sign. The driver's side window was halfway down. There was no sign of Lauer or Phelps. Their skeletal remains were found on October 21st, 1986, about six weeks after they went missing. Their remains were found in a forested area about a mile from where the car was abandoned. There were signs that Anna Maria Phelps had been stabbed to death. Daniel Lauer's cause of death could not be determined. 
is believed that they were attacked when they stopped to help someone who was posing as a stranded motorist. Then after that, the Colonial Parkway murder seemingly came to an end. No one has ever been arrested in connection with the eight murders. Less than seven years after the last murders, Laura Winans and Julianne Williams were killed in Shenandoah National Park. Several people have noted similarities between the Colonial Parkway murders and the murders of Winans and Williams. Specifically, there are several commonalities between the murders of Winans and Williams and the first Colonial Parkway homicides, the murders of Kathleen Thomas and Rebecca Dowski. They were both lesbian couples who were bound and their throats were slit. Also, their bodies were found on federal property. But besides that, not much else connects Winans and Williams murders to the Colonial Parkway murders. Nevertheless, the suspects and their murders have been investigated to see if they were the Colonial Parkway killer. The first person the investigators looked at was Daryl David Rice. When Thomas and Dowski were killed, Rice was 18 years old. The FBI does not think that Rice is responsible for the Colonial Parkway murders because he was not familiar with that area of Virginia. Whereas the person or persons responsible for the Colonial Parkway murders clearly knew the area well. Specifically, they knew where to find victims and often they hid their bodies in places that would have only been familiar to locals. They also think that the Colonial Parkway killer had a lot of control, whereas Rice was prone to act rageful. The investigators also do not think that Richard Markivonis was responsible for the Colonial Parkway murders. Ivanis grew up in South Carolina, and after high school, he joined the Navy. He was stationed in California and Florida during the Colonial Parkway murders. At the time of this video, the Colonial Parkway murders are unsolved. If DNA evidence was found at the crime scenes and it was saved, advancements might make it possible to determine the identity of the killer or killers. The advancements in DNA technology and new investigative tools like forensic genealogy may also help solve the murders of Julianne Williams and Laura Winans. Many investigators still firmly believe that they were killed by Daryl David Rice. But unless some type of physical evidence connects him to the murders, he will not be charged again. Other people point out that the physical evidence does not connect Rice to the murders and they think that the investigators developed tunnel vision. The FBI is still investigating the murders of Julianne Williams and Laura Winans. The victim's families are hoping that after nearly 25 years, their senseless murders will be solved. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please don't forget to check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. The link to the channel is in the description box. Also, please don't forget to check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. The link to the channel is in the description box.